Hi, this is Graham Clark. Uh, welcome to our webinar on the science of winning and keeping customers through customer journey management, specifically targeted at the growing number of insurance companies who are focused on this uh, fast rising trend. Uh, this is Graham Clark. I lead the North American team for Incuba, and I'm joined today by Jean Bliss, who's one of the best-selling authors in the customer experience world, uh, repeatedly ranked in the top 10 to 15 experts across the globe, uh, and also Trent Rossini, who is one of the founders and the chief operating officer of Incuba. So you can uh, you can connect with Incuba at uh, at Incuba CX, and you can uh, you can interact with us on hashtag join the journey. So who are we? So Incuba is a worldwide company uh, based out of South Africa, but with a growing portfolio of clients in almost every continent across just about every major industry. And hopefully today we'll explain to you uh, why it is that Incuba is, is growing so quickly and gaining such uh, both broad and wide recognition uh, across the customer experience industry. In addition to uh, recent recognition in 2017, which actually continues from the two most prominent global technology research companies in the world, Forrester, who listed Incuba as one of the top uh, voice of the customer vendors in the world, and, and very excitingly, Gartner, who also places Incuba at the leading edge of this this fast rising trend in customer journey analytics, another topic that we will uh, we will touch on today. So we're not going to spend a huge amount of time talking about us at Incuba. What we'll spend time do, doing is talking about uh, what the challenges that we're helping our clients meet. The most significant one being this move towards the idea of customer performance. For many years. Uh, People across the industry, including including many of our um, clients and associates, have been focused on customer experience management, customer experience optimization. Today, we've moved to a new era, which is really the the idea and the concept of customer performance. And we'll, we'll explain that today and how customer journey mapping fits into that and how the Incuba toolset is leading leading the world in providers to help our clients enable that, especially in the insurance industry. So starting at the top left, our, our client's number one goal is to help their end customers achieve their desired outcomes, focused on what are often called the three E's of effectiveness, ease, and emotional empathy, in order to drive business results, specifically increased revenue, reduced cost, greater speed of business. And that requires deep, deep customer centricity, which, is action at key customer journey points, and we'll talk more about those in a little while, in order to help customers achieve their goals. But, but we found over the last 15 years that delighted customers aren't just correlated with perfect touch points, they're correlated with excellent end-to-end -end customer journeys that comprise multiple touch points. And driving empathy and intimacy, these are quickly rising as the most important characteristics in driving operating performance for organizations as a result of a focus on customer experience. Uh, effectiveness and ease are kind of table stakes today. Empathy and intimacy is really what companies are trying to do. And that requires listening and deeply understanding customers across the journey and reacting based on the context and based on understanding the context from the customer's perspective. And in order to do that, we have to get a full view of the customer's individual journey, and we have to integrate those listening sources and data types, and then increasingly applying big data techniques and machine learning to drive interaction insights and really drive action in order to be able to execute at scale. And what you'll see in the middle is a very simple model, which is what we're seeing the leaders, especially in the insurance industry and related financial service industries focus on, is building a continuous improvement process which starts with measuring your customers, your customer experience, customer satisfaction, net promoter score, customer effort score, we all know those terms, but then understanding how those measurements, both at an overall customer satisfaction level, but also in, in relationship to specific events along the customer journey, how do those relate to your ability to improve your operating model? 
improve your business model, improving your business performance, and then acting on that, and then measuring the results of the action, understanding how that relates to the operating model, acting on it, measuring, operating model, acting, and so on and so forth. Let me hand over to, to Jean. Jean's joined us today, as I said. She's uh, one of the world's leaders. Um, she has a, a new book, which I'm sure she'll talk about. I think it was actually launched this week, but she's uh, she's been known for many years as the uh, the author and architect of uh, the concepts of Chief Customer Officer, which she followed up with Chief Customer uh, Officer 2.0. So, uh, so without any further ado, um, let me hand over to Jean, and then I'll come back and talk about the insurance industry. Great. Thanks, everybody. So good to be with all of you and uh, spend this time with you. As some of you may know, I was in the insurance industry, but have been in a lot of B2B um, businesses, B2B to C, that really rely on um, folks who advocate for you so you can advocate for your customer. And what I wanted to do was just to take a little bit of time. It, it, it sounds like from what you just said is that we're really in lockstep. And this is about delivering a deliberate experience, but mostly about embedding first what I call competencies or skill sets inside of your organization so that you move from what happens in all of our lives. You know, we present projects in red, yellow, and green dots. We talk about project plan movement, not customer life improvement. And we've got to shift the work to be about the life. What's cus What are customers going through? And most importantly, what are customers goals you just mentioned that what are customers trying to accomplish now one of the things that I articulate in a simple way we always have to really give people the ROI and the reason and the purpose for this work is moving our customers our clients to the desire experience now we've talked a, lo a lot about loyalty loyalty in some ways has become something we want to get from customers instead of what they want to achieve on their own um, and with our help now, in most of our organizations, in many ways, we're delivering inadvertently. These are good people in our companies, but we're doing all our work separately. In many places, we're delivering a random experience. Think about the differences between how the actuarial group divides and looks at and talks to customers and evaluates them versus your marketing group. You know, we've had lots of experiences, for example, where one day the same person got two letters from a company, one asking them to upgrade their homeowners to uh, add their automotive and another one where their auto, their homeowners was canceled on the same day. That's the result of people working separately, delivering rely, uh, not reliable random experiences. What we know, especially in complicated industries like insurance, like other parts of financial services, like healthcare, is just getting to reliability will differentiate you. Can you find a different way for people to understand what their policy really means? Can you simplify how to look at your bill? How, can you help people with a claim that's different and more differentiated from in terms of their life? And that will get you to desire. And so this is really our roadmap. To help you figure out how to do this, I've organized this into what I call competencies. And these competencies are things to embed inside of your organization. Each one of them, yes, is operational, but it also is cultural. And the first one is interesting. It's honoring and managing customers as assets of our business. Now, we all know we're in business to grow our customer base, but is that the metric we're looking at? A lot of times we're looking first at survey results. I'll show you where those fit in, but let's first start with what customers actually did. Customers voting with their feet. Now, a lot of times our organizations, we look at new customers. How many did agents bring in? How many did our model bring in? We, we, we wave that flag of new customers, but we don't do the math. And so what's important, and I like to articulate this in whole numbers, how many customers did you bring in in the last quarter or year or month? New customers, volume and value. We brought in 20,000 new. Terrific. You're great at acquisition. What's their value, <coughs> excuse me, as they came into the organization? But we need to do the same math and say, in that same period, how many did we lose? Volume and value. Because we need to know, yes, we brought in 20,000 new, but we lost 10,000. And this is their value. And the reason for this is, our jobs, especially in these industries where we're so metric driven, is to push customers, take them off the metric sheet, off the dashboards, and talk about the life. 
10,000 customers left. Here's what they look like. And then we need leaders and our organization to care about the why. You may also want to look at some other organizational shifts or behavioral shifts in your customer base. For example, this is what we did and achieved amazing traction with St. Jude. And they actually, most of you probably know St. Jude's Children's Hospital. They track donors. And so, and because donors are who contribute to running those hospitals and taking care of those sick kids by understanding what they, they call this the Christmas tree chart, by understanding how many donors brought, were brought in and how many donors were left, it created a complete impetus for the organization. The other thing is this word honor, because across your customer journey, you need to know where there's behaviors you're doing that inadvertently are not honoring them that will send your best customers packing. So I'm going through this very, very briefly. Um, it's all in the CCO 2.0 book, but customers as assets. It's an attitude shift, not a dashboard. This is about leaders caring about the why. Why are human beings leaving our business, not trusting us, feeling worried, feeling concerned, and changing the business model to earning the right to grow, not going to get customers. So here's three quick actions. First of all, everybody's got to work together to figure out your customer asset metric. This means sales, your actuarial people, marketing, your data. You need to come up with the one company asset, not by product, but rolling up because you know your customers in many ways and you want them to are doing are buying many product lines. The other thing is about leaders fearlessly sharing. Can they start every key meeting talking about as a result of the experience we all delivered across the customer's journey with us, did we earn the right to grow? We need to move why we're in business, not from getting the score, but to improving the life and earning the right to growth. Competency two is what many of us think of as journey mapping, but I'm going to stop you right there because it's not journey mapping. It's about aligning our accountability around the life, around the experience. And this is getting back to what you talked about earlier, which is defining and understanding our customers' goals. You know, the the interesting thing, the paradoxical thing that needs to kick in inside of our organizations is that unless we help our customers achieve our goals, their goals, excuse me, we can't achieve our own. So for example, most of us have been to the Smithsonian. If you haven't, you certainly should go. What they did was actually redefine the stages of the journey from what the customer the potential visitor is trying to accomplish. Here's a teacher, they're considering going and taking their fifth grade class. What do they need versus the traditional silo based thing would be, how do we prospect or market or get our name out there? By instead thinking about what the customer's trying to accomplish and organizing their activities and uniting all the resources that changes how they show up. How do you organize the trip before you come? Arriving at campus, there's 200 buildings and a national zoo. You know, how do you figure that out? The arrival at building experience, the experiencing a building, a lot of times, even at the Smithsonian, silos rule. It doesn't look like it connects. They've changed that. And here's what's important. The bookends, consider going is about being there where customers don't expect you to be there and back home again. This is the advocacy stage. So when you rethink what you will do for customers from the standpoint of what they need done, that changes everything. Here's another thing I love to do with companies, which is by stage of journey, especially in complicated industries, bring your leaders and then your employees together and, and by stage of the journey, talk through your code of conduct. Once you identify those stage names, and I'd say make Take the time to identify those stage names. Once you've identified those stage names by change, stage of the journey, identify what we will always do for customers and what we will never do to them. So competency two is uniting your leadership focus because once you unite your leaders around a common set of stages, and you may have a different B2B stage than B2C, that's fine, but don't boil the ocean. Start with your B2C. Unite your leadership language. 
build now a business decision blueprint, which is about what you will do by stage of the journey to be accountable to customers' lives. Here's your three actions. And again, I'm speeding through these, giving you the cliff notes, but it's powerful and important. First, take the time. Take the time. Don't jump into journey mapping too quick. Those stages are culture shifts. Identify them and the priority intersections. Build and start living your code of conduct by stage for your customers and also ask your employees by stage what's getting in their way. And then move in your CEO and your report outs in your own individual teams from silo report out <clears throat> to accountability across the journey. Competency three, I call telling the story of customers' lives. Now, what's got to happen here is I have a podcast show I call The Human Duct Tape Show because so much of our work has got to be about duct taping all of this great information and resources that we're working and building separately. You know how it goes. Your social media people present something and it's separate and people go off and do something. Your survey results come in and it's separate. You might do virtual listening or, or, or watching customers. It's separate. What we need to do is create balance and tell the story by stage of the journey. Again, so you can figure out what the missions are that your customers are trying to accomplish. So unite those multiple sources, your surveys, your social, your uh, real-time experiential listening, send your leaders out to have them try to fill out your paperwork, have them try to download something. And importantly, we need to all give up a little bit of how we categorize, because if your call center categorizes issues one way and your survey results categorize issues another way and your social categorize issues another way, it's never going to roll up. So here it's about stage three, when the customer is working and finally getting their policy and they get their first policy paperwork. Here are, here's what the customer has to go through. Here's what it looks like. Look how complicated it is. Here's what they're saying about us on social media. Here's the feedback of our verbatims. And here, by the way, is our survey score. Now what you see is we started with the life. We started with what customers went through. So customer listening is telling the story of customers' lives, the balance story. And what's going to happen when you balance that information is you're going to start to be able to focus on the things that matter most versus everybody doing their own thing. And because of the storytelling also, you see we put the survey at the end to validate what we already know. So here's your three actions. Gain agreement, you know, listening as a one company platform, as a one company approach. Again, people have got to give up some of their own listening. You know, you may be one of those companies where you've got 15 different people sending out 15 different surveys because it seems like the right thing to do, but you're driving customers nuts and your information is driving yourselves nuts too because you got a lot of it and it's just, it's cross purposing. Number two, unite sources of feedback, tell the story by journey stages and establish your version of what I call be a customer. Take every, especially in, in your world, there's so many activities we require customers to do. Start breaking them into bite-sized pieces and have your people have to do them. I remember when I was back at Allstate, if I wrecked my car or got in a fender bender or something, I didn't even go through the claim process back then. We need to know the life to serve the life. We need to do what we're requiring our customers to do. Competency four is what I call your early revenue erosion, early warning system. And, and you just mentioned that earlier, which is knowing operationally in our KPIs by knowing the right KPIs at, and operational procedures and processes before your customers tell you that things go awry. <coughs> we shouldn't have to wait for our survey feedback or even our social feedback to know where we're not meeting it for customers. Now, one of the most important things that I would suggest you do, this is a tool we do with all of our leaders as we do this work and we, we keep <clears throat> doing a, a point in time adjustment on this, is take the journey stages once you've developed them, read your verbatim comments, your survey comments, organize it by stage of the journey, have leaders by stage of the journey read those comments. I cut them into Chinese fortune cookie strips, so you're only reading 10 by stage. And then do an exercise where you put this little grid under each stage and have them put a sticker 
from your customer's life standpoint of how reliable you are in each stage. Now, this is very important. I call this part of the Vulcan mind meld process because leaders are focusing on their silo, but your customer's going through all kinds of things that make it unreliable for them. So level set your leaders on where you are today by stage of the experience. And it can't be, well, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So we're going to give ourselves a green. If it's frequently unreliable and your customers arm wrestling, you've got to check your ego and your silo at the door and rate yourself of what your customer's going through. This is very important about level setting. The other thing though, is about building those operational KPIs as you start redesigning you need to have that conversation with as much rigor as you care about sales goals. And by stage of the journey, what we just talked about is in stage three, where your customer is trying to get their information, where is, those, where is that information, that operational performance that connects to deliver reliability? So for example, in the claim experience, here's our social media feedback. Here's our complaint trend, trending. Here's what they go through. Here's the process and our KPIs will no wonder we're getting so many complaints. We're taking 20% longer than we should for 90% of our customers. No wonder this is an issue. Where are we going to go work on it? This is also this process of uniting teams to rebuild the experience. You know, when I was at in insurance, you know, we'd say the bill is broken. Well, you can't send the billing team alone to go work on the bill because the billing experience starts with the agent and how they sold the policy. And that rolls downhill then of what the customer believes they were supposed to be paying when they got that bill. So your actions here is build your experience focus to be as much of a priority as your sales focus. Those KPIs are, are important because they are your revenue erosion early warning system. Drive your process for rebuilding and then reward teams because what you're gonna see go, to go downhill and, and reduce first as you solve real problems is complaint reduction. Before surveys start flipping, before your profitability, find a reward system for complaint reduction. Your last competency is what I call the prove it to me competency. This is where leaders have to come together in the common language and talk about customers and employees' lives. <laughs> One of the first things we do is typically ask Ask our employees, what are the dumb things getting in your way? This actually is a, a, a great example. Dan Pastrick is the chief customer officer for Enersource. It's an energy company in Canada. And a young man had a piece of paper and a work order to put a power line in the front yard of somebody's house. Now, he had the chutzpah to go back to the leaders and say, I can't do this. And they said, you know, you're right. We should never send you to do something like that. So they created a process where people can fearlessly identify rules, processes, et cetera, that make no sense, that make them nuts and make customers nuts. You've got to symbolically, and then from an action standpoint, start proving to your employees first that you mean this work. The other thing that's important, and we do with every client, you can build a version, start small, is a customer room. This is where you live the life of your customer on a quarterly, a monthly, and an annual basis before annual planning and you walk through the customer's life on one wall show your growth and loss of your customers and a couple behavioral shifts and then by stage of the journey put under each stage the story where what are they going through show the screenshots have your leaders have to read and try to figure out what your cust you're saying to your customers your operational information and then your survey results of course and start circling the things that emerged that quarter or that month and what this does is it focuses your organization and your leader and you pick the few things that will make the most impact versus every silo interpreting separately doing their own thing doing multiple projects and not really improving customers lives the cadence of this also is what drives behavior change and leadership uniting their talk track and how they speak about this work. What we know is behavior shifts with repetitiveness. We need to have this happen. This is where you also then send your teams doing work back to the room to present their results so that it's an ongoing process. So competency five is the prove it to me competency where you unite the organization around behavior and accountability and enable people to deliver value. Here's your three actions. 
build your version of the customer room. My, my, uh, my version of work to you always at the beginning, clunky is good. Butcher paper, simple. Don't make it too big or too crazy. Create your kill a stupid rule movement. And then finally, this is important. You got to get rid of the multiple projects that are just getting in the way and competing with each other so that you create that capacity creation. One of the first things we do is we inventory all the projects by stage of the journey because what we've probably got are 40 different parts of the organization trying to work on the same thing. When that happens, you're not going to get traction. You're not going to move. So here's how the five competencies come together to tell the story of your customer's life. As a result of the experience we all delivered, did we earn the right to grow? By stage of the journey, let's now go along and understand the feedback that our customers are giving us, the operational performance that's yielding that feedback and those experiences. Now, what are we going to do about this? Where are we going to focus? Where are we going to prove to our customers and our employees that we care about their lives? So that is my speed read to the five competencies. Um, the Chief Customer Officer 2.0 book has that in there. I'd also suggest if you want to listen to my podcast show, these are leaders every week talking about their life doing this work. Um, it, we've just hit our 100th episode. Every kind of industry is on there, just straight talk from them to you. We're, we're having these great, honest conversations. And then finally, my new book comes out Tuesday, May 8th, called Would You Do That to Your Mother? It's a new, simplified way as well to drive this work. So that's all for me. Great. Thanks, Jean. Wow. <laughs> um, I think I probably got about 75% 70, about of that for our, for our uh, viewers. Um, in addition to the uh, to the fact that you'll be able to post some chats to Jean uh, as we get to the end of this call, um, obviously uh, the duct tape um, podcast, which is which is an amazing source of information, continuously refreshed, and then uh, and then if 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 the uh, participants are anything like me, they'll have a little Jean Bliss library uh, <laughs> section, which I have sitting right next to me at this point in time. Thank you. And if you can and if you can solve anything with duct tape, you're in good shape. So. Uh, so there we go. So let's uh, so let's pivot that a little bit and uh, and let me talk about um, you know what are insurance executives thinking about today and how do these concepts apply? So when we talk to insurance executives, uh, they have many challenges. Uh, the insurance industry is being significantly disrupted, but they're they're focused on you know value, customer value. You, you talked somewhat about that, Gene. Um, you know, getting good risk customers, having competitive premiums. Um, you know, low loss ratios, the cost of acquisition, uh, switching costs, which are which are decreasing across the industry, uh, not only in the in the direct to consumer insurance arena, but even in the producer or agent assisted arena and some of the more more complex commercial arenas. There's many ways for customers to move to new insurance providers, and and how they switch is getting easier and easier. How do they deal with, with both client and customer and producer intimacy? This idea of getting closer, even though the distance between the insurer and the client is, is changing. Sometimes it's getting further, sometimes it's getting closer. Um, you know, touch matters. How do you do that in a, an agent assisted model? Um, you know, how do you, how do you move forward on these particular areas? And then obviously digital, 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 digital. Every C-suite executive we talk to, um, is is talking about is excited by is scared by you know the impact of digital on the uh on the insurance industry and you and you'll see a, a poll um popped up on your screen which would be great if you would answer it and then how do you do that not only from the direct customer whether that customer be a consumer or a business but also in terms of the producers and agents and how do you do that in the face of an increasing portfolio of competitors? And of course, we're talking about the insurance industry, no matter where you are in the world, uh, regulators play a significant, significant portion. So while we're getting the results of the poll, let me just talk about quickly how that relates to the kind of journey that we see insurers uh, idealizing or wanting to focus on. So let's assume that our insured customer has submitted uh, an application for a policy. They've been through the acquisition process. They're on board. And we send a message to say, hey, you need to activate. 
And we have a, an insurance example that you'll see we use, Transatlantic Insurance. It's a, it's a mythical insurance company, but we've built a complete uh, scenario. So for those of you who want to talk to us further, uh, we, can, we can show you how this works specifically in the context of insurance. But our customer, Charlotte Weaver, uh, basically we see that in, in her trying to activate her policy, that she's struggling a little bit in terms of getting that done. So we reach out to her to her mobile phone, and we basically say, we see that you're having a little bit of a problem um, and that uh, and that we want to know if you want some help. And Charlotte says, yes, please. So we create a, uh, a case for one of our activation support agents, Martha Williams, to go ahead and reach out to, to Charlotte. So Charlotte uh, finishes off the activation process. And then in uh, your typical insurance example, following activation, she's fully signed up, and then we may go through months or years even of uh, standard service activities um, which follow the activation process. And before we get to a claim, you know, billing and payments being the most uh, frequent cycle and a real area of intimacy focus for organizations, but we don't want to talk about billing and payments during this particular conversation. So, so Charlotte gets to the point where she actually has uh, to make a claim and she goes ahead and she's trying to get the claims process completed and she gets really annoyed, right? Because the claims process is kind of clunky. Uh, she's not getting the response she wants from our claim service department. She's sent in some emails. They send her some forms. The forms get sent back. She doesn't hear anything. So she goes on Twitter and starts to uh, complain to her friends, hey, you know, this is not a good process. And while she's there, she puts in uh, are at Transatlantic just to make us aware that she's frustrated at it. Immediately, uh, we reach out in this ideal process and say, uh, thanks for bringing this to our attention. We'll call you and we, we create a case internally with Jeff to reach out, he's a claim specialist, to Charlotte to solve her problem. So from there, we end up with a, uh, with a happy claims process. And following that, we have a finalization process that this insurer wants to build. And that finalization process is that we send her a customer satisfaction survey to say by email, says, hey, we really want your feedback on this claim experience. Could you take a minute? And you'll notice she gives us eight out of 10, which she assesses as very good. Because she's happy, we know that's a great opportunity to make an offer and engage in a cross-sell activity. So we reach out to her because we know that she's got a new Volkswagen um, she bought the Volkswagen insurance with us. What she didn't buy is our new scratch cover. And we make her an offer, a highly compelling offer, to bring in scratch cover and pay the first three months, which results in a purchase. So when we talk to insurance leaders, they're looking to design these kind of highly engaged, highly interactive journeys that then achieve the things that we talked about earlier, blending those together. Engaging with Charlotte across every channel, whether it's uh, in person, on a cell phone, through email, through social media, in order to deliver to her experiences that she really, really appreciates and that she will tell her friends about all the way across her journey, which may in an insurance situation be months, years, or even decades. Uh, obviously our ideal situation is when we have a customer that doesn't make a claim for a long period of time. So let me, uh, let me hand this over to, uh, to Trent and he will explain a little bit more about this concept of journey management, which is rising very quickly, and then how Incuba's tools and platforms uh, enable that and allow insurers to really move to the front of the pack in terms of their competitive landscape. Great, thanks very much, Graham, and uh, thank you, Gene, for uh, the great insights that uh, you've shared today. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, really continue on the themes that uh, Gene started and, and Graham's continued on, and start to talk about how we do this at scale. It's uh, all well and good to be doing this in, in a small organization, but when you're doing it at scale in a large insurer or a large uh, telco, uh, you certainly need software to be able uh, to enable um, your, uh, your delivery in this regard. So what I want to do is I just want to uh, really kick off uh, and give you a quick overview in terms of how we think about this particular problem. Now, we quite like the, uh, the thinking that's come out of Forrester and uh, their approach is it really starts off uh, and we think about it in the same way is you have to start off with a journey map. You have to have an anchor to be able to collect data to get a sense of what the, the uh, customer's up to. And then what you start to do is you start to take in data that's actually coming from your underlying systems, 
that might be data from transactional systems, it might be quantitative data, it could be qualitative data, and you start to fuse the data into the journey uh, model, start to measure it, and in fact, you start to transform the ideal journey into the actual journey, and you get a real sense of what's going on. The next step in the, in the process is, is really using some of the insights, um, understanding the mission of the customer, as, as Gene spoke about it, is start to test how to optimize uh, and get results out of that. And you can start to improve the, the customer journey. But all this time, you've got these listening parts that are plugging into what the customer is doing, uh, monitoring them from an end-to-end -end point of view. And ultimately, what you want to do is you want to take all of these insights and feed them into uh, machine learning so that uh, there's a whole level of automation and you can get to, to mass uh, personalization. So, as I said, uh, our starting point is, um, is the customer journey. And Incuba is somewhat unique in that our approach is not a survey-centric approach. It's an approach that's actually centered around the customer journey. And we actually model the customer journey in the platform. So here we've got an example. Uh, we, uh, we're narrowing in, just give you a quick overview in terms of the, the claims error uh, and looking specifically at of measurements such as overall customer satisfaction and customer effort and resolution time. Now, if we take the claims error and we start to think about that, uh, we've got a lot of data that, that's actually happening within the organization. You've got your transactional data as people are interacting. You've got interaction data and you've got surveys. Uh, Graham spoke about how we got feedback from, from Charlotte. And you've also got uh, uh, you've got feedback that's happening in an unstructured format, and obviously you want to be able to link that into the uh, the, the rest of the model, uh, and that's exactly what the Incuba platform uh, allows us to to be able to to do. Now, once you've collected all of this data, as I said, what you can start to do is you can start to get a sense of how all of this plugs together, and actually start journeying up, uh, sorry, start drawing up the actual journey paths. And uh, one of our new capabilities on our platform is our journey analytics. We're very excited about what we're doing in this space because it really brings together the customer voice of the customer with the, uh, the journey of the customer. So let's take a, a particular example. Uh, Graham spoke about a customer that got stuck. Well, we can spot that from a customer journey. And then what we can do is we can get hold of that. We can set up a case and we can have a whole case management uh, process and make sure that the customer is managed. And uh, we also provide tools to the, uh, to the managers of the customer experience space to make sure that issues are resolved uh, appropriately. Our, uh, our next uh, example is somebody that's actually successfully activated. And you obviously want to get feedback from the customer, a more traditional survey uh, approach. And then what you want to do is you want to take all of the data, you want to assimilate it. I can have a, a quick uh, swap over here. And in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you uh, here we've got a survey, it's uh, gone out to, to, to Charlotte and I can be, uh, begin that survey uh, through a simple uh, click through and I can start to answer that survey and all of that uh, uh, data is going back into, into the platform and uh, as Gene pointed out, what you really don't want to be doing is you don't want to be fragmenting that data, you want it to be going into, into a single uh, platform. So continuing along uh, the journey, um, uh, what happens next is um, we might not be doing a great job. Charlotte's on, on social media and uh, she's tweeting away and you pick that up and obviously what you want to do is you want to be able to interact and respond to her. You also want to keep track of, of statistics uh, over a period of time. And then lastly, if you've done a really great job, uh, you want to actually learn more about Charlotte, you want to start uh, profiling Charlotte and you want to send out communications and then you want to keep track of the success of those particular uh, communications. So uh, really what I want to do uh, from this is show you how we start to build up a view of the customer um, and use that information in order to uh, more, optimize, more optimally uh, deliver against customers. Uh, right through the journey, what we're doing is we're collecting all of this data we are drawing together analytics um, that might be at an executive dashboard level, that might be at more at an analytical level. Alternatively, it could be more at an operational uh, level, uh, right down to quite a detailed level of something like call center management. So I'm going to uh, quickly swap back um, and go into the, uh, the Incuba platform. And uh, here we have an example. Uh, we're going to be talking about transatlantic, and we're specifically going to be focusing on uh, Charlotte's interaction with transatlantic. So, let me orientate you. Uh, what we've got here, we've got a dashboard. Um, this is a dashboard of Transatlantic over the last couple of months. And we can see our net promoter score. We can see our customer satisfaction. Uh, we can see new business and cancellations. We can also see a bit of a downward trend in terms of the NPS. And then uh, what we're able to see as well is we can see what people are talking about at a high level relative to, to the brand. Now, 
Um, we saw earlier that uh, we had a bit of a downward trend from, from April to June. So let's let's uh, quickly zoom in uh, on that particular uh, period of time. And let's start uh, exploring uh, through the uh, the listing paths that are established in the platform in terms of what's going on. Now, as I said to you earlier, uh, our entire model is driven by the customer journey. And that translates all the way through to the analytics. So we can actually see the customer journey here. This is the uh, the, the ideal measurement uh, journey. So we've got purchasing, administering, claiming, and complaining. And we can see claims is a bit down. We can see, oh, assessment's doing particularly badly. So let's just drill into that area. And um, we've got a couple of problems here. It seems we've got some problems with assessors. We've got some problems with communication. We've got some problems with the, with the auto shop. So I'm going to look at communication as an example. I can drill in specifically to that particular topic. And an important principle is that we always anchor all of the data we have in the platform. We unite all this, this different data together and we can see what's going on here. We can see some communication uh, from somebody called Judy. Uh, we can see Charlotte's given us some feedback. Uh, Desiree's given us some feedback. But wow, what really jumps out to us is the fact that Charlotte has given us 23 negative pieces of uh, feedback. That, that's uh, that's no, really not great. So let's go and have a look at that in a little bit more detail. Uh, and see exactly what we're doing wrong. So what the, uh, the Incubator platform does, it takes in the context of the customer. We can see that on, on the right over here. On the left, we've got the actual survey uh, feedback that came from the survey that I showed you earlier. Uh, quite a lengthy survey just for, for uh, this particular example. And we've got some comments here. Why don't you get back to me on my questions? Now, if you were the, uh, the claims manager um, or the customer experience manager and you saw this, uh, obviously you want to do something about it. And in fact, what has happened automatically, and I know that from the little triangle, is we've created a case. So the case means that uh, a task has been assigned. The assignee in this particular case is Matt. And uh, Matt is now responsible for getting hold of Charlotte and understanding what's going on. Um, it was rooted from, uh, from Janet, who, who's actually spoken to, to the customer. And you know, when they finish that uh, process, they can complete it and they can manage the outcome and they make sure that the SLAs are, are properly uh, managed. But before we can really get to a situation of being able to serve um, Charlotte, we need to understand a little bit more of what's going on uh, in Charlotte's world. And we can do that directly from within the Incubate platform. And uh, we just bring up a quick summary. We can see Charlotte Weaver. We can see her contact details, mobile. And we can see she's been quite active within uh, transatlantic insurance. So we've got uh, 14 interactions uh, with quite a lot of uh, transactional activity. So let's go have a look at that in a little bit more depth. So we're going to actually go into the single view of Charlotte. And here we have all of the data. Uh, one of the things that the Incubate platform does is it actually looks at disparate versions of uh, Charlotte coming from different uh, sources, such as Twitter, and it unifies all of those into a single profile. Then what we can do is we can actually start understanding what's happening in, in Charlotte's world. So we can see all of the interactions we've had uh, with Charlotte over a period of time. We can see emails that have been received from her. We can see uh, tweets that have happened. We can see cases that have happened uh, over a period of time and all the details sitting behind each one of those. In addition to that, we can look at the transactional data. We can see that uh, quite a number of emails have gone out. Uh, we can see that she's interacted uh, quite a lot uh, online. Uh, we can see some interactions through the call center. So it gives you more of a transactional view. And uh, we can also see from more of a qualitative point of view what Charlotte's been saying. Now, one of the key capabilities of the Incuba platform is this ability to actually anchor content uh, to the customer experience model. So we mentioned the customer experience model uh, early on. And here, what, what we're actually seeing is we're seeing a text analytics view of, uh, of Charlotte. So she's talking about the brand. She's talking a little bit about claims. Um, oh, this is scary. She's talking about uh, cancellation of a policy. So what we can do is we can see over here from a text analytics point of view um, that she's made a comment um, about a, your company lacking professionalism. I can click through and I can actually go to the underlying item uh, that uh, speaks to uh, when we spoke to uh, when she spoke to uh, Transatlantic. And in fact, I can have a, a direct conversation uh, with Charlotte directly from the platform. So it really uh, has very, very strong uh, integration in terms of pulling together all of the uh, capabilities you need to actually uh, rectify uh, the, the service of, of Charlotte. Um, and, and last of all, if I just want to have a chat with Charlotte, I can interact with her through multiple channels. I can talk to her through email. I can talk through 
uh, to her, uh, obviously on Twitter through direct messaging, and I can have an SMS um, or short message uh, text conversation uh, with Charlotte. So all of this is, is really getting a view of a single customer at a particular point in time. But obviously, as a CX manager, what you really want to understand, you want to understand what's happening uh, at a more macro level. So what we're going to do next is we're going to zoom out a little bit and we're going to have a look at things from a text, uh, what we call the text view. So we're going to get a sense of what people are talking about. So this is a really incredibly uh, strong listening path. Um, and what we can do over here is we can look at the customer experience uh, model and we can see that people are talking about uh, claims. Let's going to have a look at that in a little bit uh, uh, more detail. Um, and they're talking about uh, certain positive themes, certain neutral themes. This is obviously picked up through uh, text analytics and machine learning. Uh, and then they're talking about uh, quite a number of, uh, of issues in terms of negative themes. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, all of this is picking up on an automated basis. What I also can do is I can go and look for specific uh, terms that have been set up by Transatlantic. Uh, we call them queries. And uh, we're going to look at claims for argument's sake. So look at uh, negative claims within the environment. And we can see, this is quite alarming, uh, that the, uh, the claims, in fact, is growing over a period of time. So let's just do a quick drill down on that. And we can see all of the comments. So um, we can see over here that there are quite a number of comments um, from different customers over a period of time. Uh, and again, you can always drill down to the underlying uh, messaging. So uh, this really gives you that ability to give a, get a strong sense of what's happening in the organization. And uh, as both uh, Graham and, and Jean said, you need to put those interactions in, uh, in place, uh, interventions in place to actually rectify uh, the service at that particular uh, point in time. Now, that gives you a strong sense of what's happening. But let's go back to, to what I said earlier, which was, We've got a view of what the ideal customer journey is and how we're performing against that, but ideally what we want to do is we want to look at the actual customer journey. And that's really where our, our uh, journey analytics comes into play. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of the, uh, the data associated with all of our different customers and I'm going to start looking at the different paths. So what we've got here is we've got a view of customers as they've been navigating through the organization uh, each one of these little steps um, is a, a view of a path that a customer has taken, in this case from receiving quotes um, uh, to, uh, 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 sorry, uh, from an application from an agent to receiving uh, a quote. Uh, in this particular case over here, from application in the branch to receiving a quote uh, in the branch. And let's say we, we've actually taken a step back and we've got a particular problem associated with the acquisition um, uh, within this organization. So what we're going to do is we're going to select a certain journey path. Uh, let's se select the uh, web application path, receive uh, path, and um, for instance, those people that are submitting docs, um, but they've actually been declined. And what we can do is we can create uh, what we call a, a, a target audience rule. So create that target audience rule. There are quite a number of parameters that we can define. So we can either look uh, back in history at people that have been through that path, Alternatively, um, we can look uh, forward at uh, customers that will go through that path, and we can give that a name. We can call that, you know, customers, um, uh, customers uh, that uh, fell off, uh, and we can save that uh, within the environment. We're going to use that uh, a little bit later on. So that allows us to get a strong sense of what's going on and actually identify customers not just that have gone through. Uh, one particular transaction, but in fact have followed a particular uh, journey path. Let's take um, uh, let's take our our next scenario. So let's say we wanted to look at now successful customers, and we're going to choose a a slightly different path. We're going to choose one that uh, somebody that's put in an application through an agent and ultimately has activated in the web environment. Um, and uh, again, we can add another path. Let's say someone's coming through the web environment. Um, uh, they've uh, they've uh, been successful, they've uh, gone in online, and again, they've activated. And we can create another journey path. And again, we can create a target audience um, that we can use uh, at a later, later stage. So the, uh, the Ingiver platform is somewhat unique uh, in the fact that it has this ability to actually set up uh, target audiences. Now, the question obviously is, what do we do with those? And what we're going to quickly do is we're going to head on over to the engagement path, uh, part of the platform. And I'm going to show you um, how we use uh, those insights to actually target customers. So first off, we're going to uh, set up a, 
uh, an interaction to actually obtain uh, feedback from customers uh, that gets a sense and we're going to target uh, those uh, customers that have actually uh, declined and uh, this is the the rule that we set up uh, earlier on and we can now send out a message to those particular uh, customers and we can start getting feedback in terms of what the issue is so um, here we've got uh, the ability to to draw up a, a interaction or an engagement within the platform we can ask what the, the reason is and then ultimately what we can do is we can go through a, a preview process. Here we can see that we're gonna send out a, a communication uh, uh, to Ronan, uh, another one that's going out uh, to, to Kathy. So at the end of that process, what we're gonna do is we're gonna get some analytics back. And um, here we, for instance, let's go and have a look at, uh, at our millennials um, and let's go and see why they, they're not interacting with us. And we can see exactly what the reason is. So, uh, what we've got over here is the majority of people are, are, are not taking it up because of price. Um, a little bit uh, less is because of effort um, and uh, suitability. And the next thing we can do from that is we can then set up an engagement uh, that allows us to go uh, out uh, to individuals and uh, actually ask uh, customers um, whether they'd be interested in our offer that uh, actually uh, uses the insight of the fact that they're unhappy with price and actually offers them a, a, a specific offer uh, that's an advanced driving course. So we're going to send it out to all people um, that are price sensitive and we're going to put a communication together. And uh, I just want to show you how we can do the, the mesh personalization. So um, obviously based on the data we collected in the single view, we understand that different customers have uh, different vehicles. Um, so here we can see Ronan, for instance, is a, a, a Toyota driver. Uh, we go through to, uh, to, to Rooney, uh, the VW uh, driver. So that really talks about the journey analytics. It talks about the, the engagement elements. I'm going to uh, finish off in the, uh, the limited time uh, that we have available. Um, I'm just going to quickly uh, finish off and show you that uh, we have extensive dashboards so we can make sense of what's happening with it. So all of the data that we're collecting across the board is being brought into the, uh, the platform. Uh, we can drill down into particular areas, we can assess uh, particular individuals, um, and um, obviously we can make sense of, um, in the claims context, which repairers are doing a good, good job and which uh, potentially are doing a, a bad job. We've also got operational reports. These are, are reports that typically would be going out to your operational folks uh, on a daily basis, uh, and these are really useful uh, to help your operational areas uh, effectively um, manage uh, the environment and in fact, these reports are sent out on, on an automated basis. So uh, we are a little bit up against the clock today. Um, that really concludes what I wanted to, to run through in terms of the, um, uh, the, the, the demonstration. And uh, I'd like to hand back to uh, Graham just to, to finish off for the day. Perfect. Thanks, Trent. Um, so uh, so we're, as you said, we're pushing up against the uh, the end. I do want to make a couple of comments. Um, we were starting to get some questions on the chat window. We will um, we will uh, we will take those questions and we will we will uh, aggregate them up and feed them back. So in addition to uh, getting you a copy of Gene's book and uh, as you would expect, we'll send you a survey. Um, we'll also send you the results of the polls and an aggregated list of the questions that we were asked with answers. But just uh, just in closing, you know, when you when you look at this this world of customer journey management, right? Not just customer journey measurement, not just customer experience, but actual active customer journey management. Like so many things, uh, personally in the business world today, uh, this is technology enabled, right? You can't do what Trem was just describing. You can't really do what Gene was talking about in a real insurance company, whether direct to consumer or agent producer assisted, whether consumer focused or business focused without technology and technology that is multi-channel, that is multi-metric. If you were paying attention, you'd have noticed that there was net promoter score, CSAT and other metrics that aggregates the customer experience metrics with the business metrics in terms of the impacts that Gene was talking about that needs to be today 100% cloud, that's open API and can integrate with all your other investments, whether it be a digital marketing platform, whether it be your contact center platform, your email platforms and other elements of your enterprise, and then supports the ability both to respond relative, immediately or relatively immediately to your customers to get on top of these issues before they build, but also being able to look at these issues in aggregate to be able to step back and systemically 
uh, improve your business. And that's what Incubo has brought to the marketplace. It's the reason why we're seeing so much excitement from the analysts and so much excitement from global insurers. And uh, I really want to thank you for your time and look forward to, to chatting with you in the next weeks and months um, to respond to the inquiries that you have. Really appreciate your time.